So yeah, let's get started. First things first, um, ah yeah, I need to do two, I need to remember. So if I'm out of sync and it looks weird, let me know that I'm talking about the wrong thing. Um, so a very brief bit about player research, first of all. Uh, we're a user research consultancy. Seb mentioned all this before, but I'm just gonna go over it again very briefly. Um, we work exclusively in the games industry, so we don't work on apps or websites or anything like that. Um, collectively, across our studio in Brighton and our studio in Montreal, we've worked on over 550 games. Myself, having contributed to over 100, I think, now of them. Sorry, two hearts. Uh, so what I'm gonna cover today, um, I'm just gonna go through very briefly again what, what I'm gonna go through. Uh, first things first, I'm gonna talk about why we bother with interviews. What's the, what's the point? What are we looking to get out of them? Um, following that, we're gonna go about what interviews aren't so good at. There are certain things that, it, there are limitations in interviews, so I'm gonna cover those again very briefly. Um, preparing for an interview, writing great questions, getting a really good structure together for your interview. Writing killer questions. Uh, and then finally, executing the interview. Some tips and tricks that you guys can use and take away to make sure that you're getting the best data you can, that you can and making sure that you're not leaving any data on the table. Uh, just a couple of things that I'm not gonna cover. Uh, we can talk about this afterwards if you've got more questions and come and find me, I'm happy to talk about it, but I'm not gonna cover it here. Uh, behavioral observation, so the, the portion before the interview. Um, writing up issues, uh, recruiting players and the recruit process and finding the right player. And I'm not gonna talk about interviewing kids or interviewing in groups. I might touch on um, some of the difference with interviewing kids as we go along, but on the whole, I'm not gonna cover it. So let's start with the limitations of interviews. Um, there, are, there are a couple. The first one is that memory is fallible. Asking players to explain why they did certain things or why they made mistakes or what they didn't understand pretty much just doesn't work. Uh, I'm gonna cover it a little bit later on, but players on the whole, and in my experience, aren't so great at remembering their motivations behind certain things earlier on in the session. And so similarly to that, what players say and what they do and what you've observed them do can often be very different. Um, there's countless times where I've seen someone failing with certain things over and over again, only to ask them afterwards, oh, how did you get on with that certain thing? And absolutely fine, no problems, of course. So you know, having watched them, that is not the case. Um, it can be tough to, to keep players on track. Um, they're often you know, brimming with ideas and thoughts about the game and that they've just played. Um, and it's our responsibility as researchers to try and parse out the information that's useful to us uh, and not disregard, but not weigh quite so heavily on the stuff that's less useful. Um, and it's also easy to introduce biases in the interview process. Uh, this is something my colleague Bob's gonna talk about more after me, um, but there are, there are certain things that are easily, easy to influence players by doing. Um, and it's our, again, our responsibility to try and minimize these as best we can. And finally, they can be quite resource intensive. Realistically, you're, if you're interviewing someone and doing usability play tests, you might get through six participants in a day. With a survey, you could do 100 perhaps. It's, uh, it's a lot, you get a lot more data from doing surveys, but um, yeah, interviews can be quite resource intensive and as such quite expensive uh, as a service. In spite of all this stuff, uh, and there's only a few limitations, uh, they are an incredibly, well, they can provide an incredibly rich source of data uh, and allow the opportunity to probe deeper into player motivations and player understanding and their experience where you wouldn't be able to do that with a survey. So there we go. That's why we bother with them. Um, just not skip through on here. There we go. Um, so first things first, they allow you to corroborate the observational data that you've got. As I mentioned before, uh, at Player Research, we're, we're pairing the interviews with observational data, <coughs> and the interviews provide that opportunity to get a lens on the data that you've seen and you've observed players doing. Um, additionally, they give, oh, oh wait. additionally, they give you some context uh, for that data. Um, they give you, so for what you've just seen, it allows you, as I mentioned, to get more information and a whole picture of the experience and of the understanding that the players received. So, a bit of background covered. Let's go on to preparing for an interview. Um, so this is where I want to talk about the getting a good structure and writing great, great questions. So we will start with structure. Making sure that you've got a solid structure is a really important first step in preparing for your interview. You're never gonna be able to build up a dialogue and get the data that you need 
from just asking questions in any old random order. It doesn't really work, unfortunately. Um, so I'm going to go through the flow of an interview as we do them at Player Research. Again, people might do them differently. That's fine. Um, but this is roughly how we do it. So this is pretty much what it looks like. Um, so we start with general questions, general impressions. Uh, these serve a number of useful purposes. First of all, they provide an opportunity just to get the player talking. They can be easy, low-ball questions. What did you think of it? What are your general impressions? And they're incredibly useful for just getting the player talking. Um, they also give an opportunity to get just the raw, unbiased thoughts before you start asking questions about certain things and perhaps leading them or, or pushing them in certain directions. Uh, from there, we move into the more specific things about understanding and usability. Uh, this is your opportunity to really get some of the main meatier bits of data that you're looking for. Uh, and after that, move into the experience, the slightly more woolly subjective questions uh, that might provide a more interesting lens on some of the usability stuff and understanding stuff that you've seen before. Uh, and then from there, we go into kind of a summary. And then the miscellaneous section is perhaps developers feeding you questions through a Skype message or something that they want you to ask or things that you've missed or whatever it may be. Um, these are more just sort of on the fly kind of things to find out. Uh, also, any other thoughts the player might have that you've not covered in the interviews you've gone. So, as I say, this is the structure that we use. The reason we use it like this is starting out with understanding, well, after the general, starting out with understanding, um, it basically allows you to find out if players, if they don't understand certain things, you can reshape the interview as you go and make sure that you're not asking questions about usability and things like that on mechanics that they didn't understand. Um, or framing those questions differently, perhaps. So generally, we work forward from behavior. So what can you do in this game? That's the, the basic level. What did the player sit there and do in the time before the interview started? From there, you go into how did you do that? So this is when you're starting to ask questions about usability and understanding. And then into the how many, any difficulties that they may have had with that stuff. So, I skip forward quite a lot on here. Um, so not all of the experience questions that you ask are about the experience necessarily. In a usability playtest, we're not particularly interested if the player liked it or if they had fun. As much as developers usually want to know that stuff, uh, it's not what we're looking for in a usability playtest. Uh, so these experience questions and equally the more general questions um, are just really useful for getting the player talking, getting them thinking about their experience in a perhaps more critical way that you're, that you're hoping for as you move forward. So this question um, is probably the best question, I would say. Um, what are your general impressions of the game? It, first of all, it gives an incredibly useful, unbiased impression, as I mentioned. It gives you uh, it gives you the player's raw thoughts, um, but it also gives you perhaps some shared language to use as you go forward in the interview. You can mirror the language that they're using. It helps build up some rapport and build up your relationship with them. It also gives you a very useful first read on where you might want to take the interview to start with. If you come in and ask them this and they say, yeah, I liked it, but you know the controls are a little bit crap, then you know, okay, they want to talk about controls. That's great. They had a bit of a struggle with it and you can move forward and dig into that and understand where the problems were. They're already talking about it. They're already thinking about it. Okay. So having a great structure is obviously, as I mentioned, very important, but it doesn't really mean anything unless you've got good questions to go into that structure. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a reasonably seminal uh, cognitive psychology study uh, by Loftus and Palmer in the 70s. Uh, this study was looking into eyewitness testimony and the accuracy of memory, basically. Uh, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with this if there are psychologists in the room, undoubtedly. Um, basically, in a, in a nutshell, they showed their participants a video of two cars crashing into each other and then asked them to estimate the speed that they thought the cars were going. Uh, but it's the way they asked the question which is the, is the condition, as it were, in the, in the study. So about how fast were the cars going when they collided, hit, bumped, smashed, or contacted each other? Uh, so they, they asked them this one of these questions and then asked them to estimate how fast they were going. So the graph shows the estimates of the speeds um, that, the, that the participants gave in the study. 
So as you can see, the slightly more emotive words like smashed elicited a much higher speed estimate than the less emotive ones like contacted. Additionally, they asked play, uh, participants if they saw any broken glass in the video that they'd just watched. Uh, there wasn't any in the video. Um, and they found that 32% of the players who were exposed to the smashed condition said they did see broken glass, whereas in the hit condition, only 14% did. So although perhaps a bit of a cliche of a study, it's incredibly illustrative of how easy it is to lead participants and lead people just by the way you ask questions and even just certain words that are different. Additionally, it shows how easy it is to implant false memories in people's heads by asking questions in a certain way or just by asking them at all. So basically the main takeaway for us as user researchers is that the fact that we, well, the fact that the way we ask questions can directly impact the data that we're collecting from players. So a few tips for asking good questions, basically and writing good questions. Um, the first thing is ideally you want to be using neutral language as, be as much as you can when you're asking questions or writing questions. In some cases, that's not necessarily possible. Um, there's, certain, there's certain things that you just can't ask in a neutral way without sounding incredibly stilted or forced or weird. Uh, and if that's the case, then you want to lean towards um, negativity in some way. Um, if you need to reframe a question, negativity can be, can be the best way to go. It is admittedly slightly leading to some degree, but it does help avoid the feeling that the player is meant to be giving positive responses. Um, setting this tone is something I'm going to touch on a little bit later, but setting a tone of constructive criticism is what you're looking for here. Um, beware of phrases like easy to use. Oh, hello. There you go, spoiler. Um, so yeah, phrases like easy to use, uh, they've got that kind of positivity built into them that you want to try and avoid as best you can. Again, closed questions. Um, it's a very absolute statement saying avoid them. It's not necessarily the case. Um, but if you can, try and avoid closed questions. They don't allow the player to spontaneously explain any of their feelings or anything like that. And closed questions, in this case, I mean questions that require an answer that's either yes or no, or just one word, or don't require any extra explanation. Um, so admittedly, these two on the right are closed questions, but they're, they do encourage more explanation than just, do you like this game? Yes. Okay, next question. It's not going to get anything out of that. So some things to avoid asking about if you can. Again, quite an absolute statement. Um, and almost all of the things I'm going to say here have caveats to them, which I'll very, go through very briefly, but generally things to bear in mind as you go through. So try not to ask about solutions. At Player Research, we don't really ask players to try and come up with other ideas for how this particular problem that they've been experienced could be solved. Um, on the whole, players aren't necessarily designers. They don't really know how a game mechanic could be improved in order to improve the experience. Um, solutions, in some cases, it can be a useful thing just to get an idea of maybe hooking back to the original problem and digging deeper in there. But on the whole, it's something not to ask about if you can. Uh, projections, equally, um, players might say, oh yeah, I definitely play this when I went home, or uh, I don't really think it's for me, but I'm sure kids would like it. That kind of thing is not going to be particularly useful realistically. Um, what they say in the moment and their you know, predicted future behavior in, of themselves, chances are it's not necessarily going to be that accurate. Uh, equally with audience fit, if they say, it's, it, I think it'd be great for kids. Unless they are kids, they're probably not actually going to know if that's true or not. So yeah, audience fit, similarly. So rating scales as well. Um, this one perhaps comes with the biggest caveat. Uh, we don't tend to ask players to give ratings of certain things, their experiences or whatever in an interview setting, um, but they can be useful at times if you're working with someone who's you know, particularly reluctant to give up the goods and they're not really talking as much as you might want them to. Or with kids, it can be quite handy as well just to get them talking and get them thinking critically about certain things. But on the whole, and if you can avoid it, try not to ask about ratings or ask, ask players to rate things in the game. So, 
You've prepared for your interview. I had to get it in somewhere. Um, you prepared for your interview, and you've got a great structure. You've got some great questions. Um, so now we can think about actually executing the interview. So talking with players is a number of things. Um, perhaps stressful, some of you might be thinking. Um, awkward, maybe. Can be error prone, as I've kind of covered before, and as Bob's going to cover a bit more later. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's necessary. It's part, of, it's part of the job. It's part of getting great data and getting great findings for user research. It's worth noting that as researchers, it might be stressful, it might be awkward, but for the player, it's probably twice as stressful and twice as awkward. So it's not just you as the researcher that's fight feeling these things. Um, it's almost like a, like a first date to some degree. It's kind of slightly, slightly awkward. You, you don't know what to say, they don't know what to say. Um, so it's not just you as the researcher. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, there are a ton of great things about interviewing players. And unfortunately for not the most useful thing to say, perhaps to all the juniors in the room, a lot of it does come with practice. Um, you just generally, the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. Um, I just want to make sure with this that you've got the best start you can. Oh, apologies. There you go. So first tip for executing a great interview, silence is golden. And what I mean by this is that there's going to be certain pauses in the conversation after they finish answering your questions or before you get your head together for the next question where there's short periods of silence. Don't worry about them. Embrace them. They're super useful and they're really not as awkward as you feel they are in your own head. So they give the player a chance to think and in some cases, they give the player a chance to expand on the answer that they've just given. If there's that slight period of awkwardness, the player might strive to fill it with more information, stuff that you wouldn't have got if you just launched straight into the next question. Uh, it, gives, it gives you a chance to think about what you're going to ask next. Uh, and it gives time for elaboration, as I mentioned. Players can, players can ask or answer more in more depth than they might have done otherwise. As I say, it might feel awkward. Trust me, it's really not that bad. So something I touched on before, um, setting a tone of constructive criticism, being slightly negative about the game in some way uh, can help the player feel that it's okay to be negative themselves. Negativity is really it's the data that you want. If everyone's just saying it's fine, yeah, no problems, then you're not gonna get much out of the interview. Those, one, those interviews where players are super positive and just, yeah, absolutely, no problems, this was fine, this was fine, this was fine, can be some of the harder ones, if anything, just because encouraging them to think critically and think negatively and give you some more data it can feel quite forced to some degree if they're just trying to be positive all the time. Uh, one way of doing this is blaming the game. Uh, so letting the player know that it's a prototype and it's in a prototype stage, there's improvements that still can be made in the development cycle uh, is, is a really useful thing to be able to do to encourage players to give you some negative feedback, give you some constructive criticism, I should say. So, Follow-up questions. These are going to be pretty much vital in conducting a great interview. You've written, your, you've written your interview guide, you've got your questions that you want to hit, but these are the ones that you need to come up with on the fly and make sure that you're probing deeper and getting as much information out as you can. So not only will they help you, like I say, dig deeper and get more information, but they'll help the conversation flow more naturally. A conversation if it's just totally one-sided and me reading a list of questions and the player answering the questions feels very stilted and weird and unnatural. Answering, asking follow-up questions, digging a little bit deeper just helps everything move forward in a way that's much more fluid. So a couple of things to think about when you are asking follow-up questions though, is try and avoid making the player feel stupid. Um, so what I mean by this is using, using the player language here. So if they say, yeah, I collected some of the gold things, but you know in your head that they are gold bars, don't ask them, oh, tell me more about the gold bars. It communicates immediately that they've got something wrong. Uh, and it's just going to make the player feel awkward, effectively. And it's going to perhaps push them back into their shell and they might not be as forthcoming as they, as they would have done. So you want to avoid players feeling like they've misunderstood something. So if they, if they express a particular issue or a sentiment or something, instead of saying, oh, why do you think that? Because if you know they're wrong, Instead say, how do you know that? So you're, you're letting the player know that they are, they're correct, even if you know they're not. 
well, just another thing to note on that one, actually. Um, generally, unless their misunderstanding is going to impact the interview and impact the data that you're going to collect later on, just don't correct them as best you can. So, affirmation statements. Uh, I don't know if this is what these are called. This is what I've been calling them. Um, basically, these are the, the words, the utterances that you make when a player is giving you answers. So, the interest things, the okay, the sure, that kind of stuff. The, the things that you say to make it clear that you're listening to the player and that you're <coughs> hearing and understanding what they're saying. Uh, they're not all made equal. Um, so, well, for example, an interesting is a lot different from a an interesting. These are extreme examples, perhaps, but there's a big difference there in the, the value of the answer that you've just been given. So generally, they should be consistent as much as you can and unreadable. So, yeah, you might, you know, build up better rapport with some of your participants than others. Uh, you might, they might be playing the same games that you're playing or you just get on with them particularly well. Uh, generally, you really want to make sure that no matter how well you get on with someone or how much rapport or less rapport you have, you want to keep these things consistent as best you can. So the next things to keep an eye out for are value words. Again, I'm not sure if that's what these are called, but that's what I'm calling them. Um, so these are things like clunky or complicated or anything that appears on the surface meaningful, but could be pretty wide open to interpretation. Uh, these are your opportunities to dig in. These are the doorways for real insight. Um, so if a player says, oh, you know, combat felt a little bit clunky or something like that, that's for you. That should be a big red flashing light saying, ask more about combat. Um, yeah, so there's, uh, there's, a, there's a few examples, but there's, there's a lot that I'm sure you can imagine uh, that, are, that are similar to some degree. But these are the ones to keep an eye out for. These are your real opportunities for insight. So the last thing that I'm going to go through uh, is just a phrase book, effectively, of useful questions, useful handy phrases that you can drop into your interviews as you're, as you're conducting them, either ones that you can write into the guide ahead of time, or you can just use on the fly as you go. These are just some of the ones that I think are quite important, and a lot of the ones that I use when I'm conducting interviews, absolutely not exhaustive. Please come up with your own. Tell them, tweet them at me. It's fine. I'd love to know. Um, so the first one, the most, perhaps one of the most useful ones, if you're, if you're interrupting a player or if you're just starting the interview, just a, quite a simple, how's it going? It's very similar to the, what are your general impressions? It gives you that initial read of the player and they can express and air any problems that they might have had in that kind of immediate period before you ask that question. There we go. Uh, so yeah, as, I, as I, I've been over general impressions, so I'm not going to say that one again. Uh, what did you do in the game? That's another one that I've mentioned before. It's your opportunity to start working forward from behavior. So establish the raw basics. What did they do? And then go forward from there into how did they do it? Did they understand? Did they have any problems? So I want to make sure I understand this. Can you explain a little more? Um, useful for two reasons. First of all, it's useful because it puts the onus on you as the one that didn't understand. It's not, you didn't explain that well enough, please can you explain it again? It's, I didn't understand, I'm you know, not listening properly or whatever, can you explain it again? You should be listening by the way, make sure you do. Um, it also gives you an opportunity to, thank you, um, get the player to answer the question again effectively. If you feel like they've given you an answer that's maybe not got quite as much meat as you wanted or you know they're holding something back, I didn't quite understand it, can you explain it again? It might force them to reframe the way they're answering the question and give you some more data. So, a few more. Could you tell me about that again? Very similar, uh, just a slightly different way. Um, what are you thinking? So, at Play Research, generally we don't do that much task-based, uh, we don't do that much think aloud, I should say. Uh, I'm not gonna go into why, but by all means ask afterwards and I can tell you. Um, but it is useful if you're doing some task-based stuff. You can get the player to explain their thought processes in the moment and let you know what they're understanding or not understanding. So this is your, your value word ex, uh, exploration. So you said you felt the combat was clunky. Why did you think that? This is your first step into getting some more information there. 
So I'll, I'll do what would you expect it to do last. Uh, is there anything that we've not covered that you want to mention? This is your, you know, your miscellaneous bit at the end. Anything that the player might have that they want to mention? Nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, perhaps, they're just going to say no. But every now and again, you'll get a little nugget of something that you might not have got if you didn't ask this question. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not. It's worth getting. Uh, and then finally, the what would you expect it to do? This is the one um, that if a player asks you a question in the interview, so uh, the, this particular contr control did that, is that right? Instead of you just telling them yes or no, what did you expect it to do? That gives you an idea of their understanding of the particular mechanics. It allows you to get some more information. Uh, so I've uh, got a couple of minutes left. So a very brief summary. Um, first things first, I'm gonna make sure you're focused on creating a great structure, carefully considering the order that you ask questions and how that order might impact the player responses. You wanna make sure that you're asking questions in a way that don't lead the player, obviously, but also maximize the value of the information that they're providing for you. Uh, and then finally, keep an ear out for opportunities to dig deeper. Make sure that you're not leaving any player data on the table. So thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have time for any questions because um, I know we're on a very tight schedule and Bob is up next. Uh, so, but by all means, I'm gonna be here afterwards. So come and find me, ask me anything you want. Uh, that'd be great. Lovely stuff, thank you.